Hello and welcome to Bandwidth Conversations, a podcast that finds out about the stories and journeys of artists, performers and rock stars of life. I'm Katie Brewer and today I am talking to someone who I think is a complete rock star. While most ordinary people seek comfort, safety, a quiet life, this man searches for the opposite. The places from where people flee, he goes. Wherever there is drama, trauma, conflict, he is there. He is a journalist who has covered and reported from some of the most hostile places on earth. His career has spanned the BBC, Al Jazeera and ITN. He is a reporter, a documentary maker, author, newscaster and is now international affairs editor at ITV and a presenter on News at 10. He is also a dear friend from university and I am so grateful he is taking the time to talk to me today. I am delighted to be talking to Raggy Omar. Thank you, Katie. So you were born in Mogadishu, although your family actually come from Hargeisa in the north. But at the age of five, you and your family moved to the UK. Do you remember that? I have little snippets in my memory. Unlike today, it wasn't a sort of direct flight. So we did, had loads of hops. So we went from Mogadishu and I think we went to Khartoum and then we stopped off in Rome <laughs> and then eventually in London. So it took about three, four days just to get here. I remember just the colours. I remember the neon lights, which I'd never seen. I felt the cold because I think we arrived in, in winter. <laughs> so it was just a really sensory overload. It was just the smells, but the light in particular, you know, a huge city because Mogadishu is a, a coastal city. It's on the Indian Ocean coast. It was a very quiet city. So that's what I sort of remember. And the big red buses, I remember that taking me aback. Yeah. So little nice flashbacks. Did you speak any English at that point? No. And that's one of the clear memories I have, because obviously kids, they've got a sort of international language of their own, whatever languages they speak, they just seem to get on. So that never really troubled me. I didn't step in thinking, crikey, I don't <laughs> understand what anyone's saying. But no, I didn't speak any English, but I describe it almost like an experience of, you know, when you're talking, but you have your ears closed, you don't know what you're saying, but you're clearly saying something <laughs> and people are sort of reacting. So that's what I remember. And of course, it was just the first time I'd just been in a room really full of people who weren't African, who weren't black. But as I say, I was just thrilled to be going to school. It was in London, in Ladbroke Grove. And yeah, I just really uh, enjoyed it. I think my mother was much more worried. Would I get on? Would I have culture shock and all of that? But as I say, kids just get on with it. And I did. What was the thinking behind the move for your parents? My dad was a self-made businessman. He was doing a lot of work with British companies out in East Africa. And because his work was taking him to the UK quite a lot, and because, you know, Hargeisa or Somaliland, as it is now, was a former British colony, he was quite an Anglophile. So he thought he wanted to bring his kids here and give them a British education, as many people around the world who can afford it still want to sort of do. So that was his game plan, was to educate all of us, my siblings, and come back to Somalia and become, I don't know what, business people or civil service, whatever it was. I mean, but his plan was always to go back to Somalia. And what sparked your interest in world affairs? Was it something that happened at home? I think you're absolutely right. I don't have anyone in my family before me who was a journalist, but I came from a family that were just natural news junkies. <laughs> so the thing about Somalis is we come from a nomadic culture. So Post-independence, you know, in 1960, lots of relatives just traveled the world. They went to the Middle East, where there was a big oil boom at the time, to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, went to different parts of Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, to the US. We just were global nomads. So I grew up in a family where around the kitchen table, there was always some conversation going on about world affairs and everyone had an opinion. So we talk about apartheid in South Africa or the various wars in the Middle East and the Iranian revolution. It kind of filled my head with these amazing stories. And also we had relatives all over the place who'd be coming via London, because even back then, London was like the Clapham Junction of the world. So we always had relatives who'd come by and talk about living in Riyadh or living in Kuwait or living in Lagos. And it just gave me a bit of a wanderlust, I guess. I think that's where, before I knew I wanted to do journalism, I think I wanted to just 
live in different places and see different societies and cultures. And obviously journalism was a route to it. You go to school, you go to the Dragon, you then go on to Cheltenham College and then to New College, Oxford to read history. And in fact, you've talked a little bit about it already, but I'm going to read to you what Michelle Obama said in her autobiography about her time at Princeton. And she said, I'd never been part of a predominantly white community before. I'd never stood out in a crowd or a classroom because of the color of my skin. It was jarring and uncomfortable, at least at first, like being dropped into a new terrarium, a habitat that hadn't been built for me. Now, obviously, you had had that experience from the age of five. But I look back at our freshers photo and you are the only black face in that photograph. And I kind of thought that I was quite a thoughtful person. But in my teenage fug of self-absorption, I hadn't occurred to me what that might feel like for you. And so how... 30 years on, how did that feel? That's a really good question because in some ways I'd just been, I don't know if the word hardened to it is the right phrase, but I just became used to it previously because the same thing could have been in terms of uh, the freshest photo at the Dragon School or the freshest (laughs) photo at Cheltenham. (laughs) There was a little bit of situation where at those schools there were students from different parts of the world, but tiny, three, four max in a year of each, what, 150, 200 or so. And I suppose it just made me feel early on that to look beyond my colour, but not deny it. And I think that's the sort of theme that became part of my journalism, I suppose. It's just being able to blend between cultures. I mean, I suppose I'm a cultural schizophrenic, if you like. So I just <laughs> leap from one thing to the other. And That's certainly a help, especially in journalism, because you have to be different personas while staying true to yourself. I mean, it wasn't so much the case at university because we're just all friends and everyone, as you said, we had that fog of self-absorption and having fun. But it's a really hard one to unpack. I suppose when you're able to show people to see past their immediate reaction to you, that does help build a certain self-confidence in your own skin. I think that was vital. Not true for everybody, I think. I mean, other people that were in the similar situation, school wasn't easy for them at all. And it wasn't a case of self-confidence. And it's something they've probably been unpacking for years. Well, in fact, it was no surprise, really, that you ended up becoming a journalist, because I do remember when we were all trying to find you at college, the chances were that you were going to be in the JCR reading a stack of newspapers from sort of (laughs) cover to cover. (laughs) But when you were actually there, you didn't do any journalism, you didn't do Cherwell or any of those sorts of things. We all did, didn't we? Our sort of group of friends. It was kind of uh, the last thing we sort of wanted to do, especially at Oxford, was to be a political hack or a journalistic hack. It seemed very, very cliquey. There were you know, a lot of people just went and said, right, I'm just going to be the editor of the college magazine or the university of this, or I'm going to be the president of this society. And it just never dawned on me at all that that was what it was about, as I found (laughs) out much to my detriment when I ended up actually (laughs) trying to become a journalist and get newspapers and broadcasters to hire me. Maybe I should have done that. Well, you leave in 1990. And yeah, I would say we were all really good at lounging around, I think, (laughs) at (laughs) university. But were you thinking at that point, when you were at university, were you thinking, as soon as I leave, I'll go back to Somalia? Or had you at that stage thought, I'm going to think about journalism? I think it was like right just before I arrived at university, the situation in Somalia had just collapsed into civil war. I think really from about 84, 85 was when it sort of began and really reached a crescendo just as we were leaving. So by that time, I think my father's plans had fallen apart and it hit him hard because Somalia then burst into those international headlines when the UN intervened and the American troops went into Mogadishu and it just became, sadly and remains, a failed state. So at that stage, even though throughout my teenage years, we were going back, we'd do summer visits to relatives and so forth, but that just became impossible, certainly by the time I got to university. So at that stage, yeah, by the time we all left, it was clear that that was not an option. And and I sort of felt UK was home by then personally, even if the situation had remained really, really good in Somalia, and I wish it had not collapsed into civil war and all that suffering. I don't think I would have gone back there because I think um, 
the kind of person I was had already been shaped by being in the UK. And that's true of a lot of people who are in the diaspora of various societies. So when we left, I was going to be here in the UK. And by that time, I was starting to think about trying to get a traineeship of some kind to get into journalism. You start at The Voice, don't you? And how did that happen? Just the usual way of just writing (laughs) begging letters, lots of begging letters. I mean, the thing is, journalism is even to this day, it's as is true, sadly, in a lot of sort of avenues of life, contacts and family connections are really important. Not always. I mean, if you want to be a lawyer, you have to be a good lawyer. You can't just. But in journalism, I think because there isn't a formal structure, anybody could be a journalist, really, unlike law or medicine or engineering or finance and banking. There's no real technical credentials or expertise that you need to have. So therefore, it's a lot of place where family connections sort of help. So I didn't sort of really have that. It didn't matter. So I just wrote off. And the voice still is, you know, the sort of principal newspaper in this black British community in the heart of sort of Brixton. It was kind of a finishing school, really, for people from black and Afro-Caribbean backgrounds who then went off to national organizations and, and newspapers. So I just basically ended up working for free for several months. But it was just being around a newsroom and seeing what happened. And, and I loved it. And then you have a graduate scheme at the Financial Times, which you go for. Is that while you're still at The Voice or is that afterwards? It was while I was at The Voice and someone said, Look, I mean, you know, you seem like you really want to sort of do international news. Why don't you go and apply for the FT? They're an international media organization and they have a very, very good traineeship and which lasted like a year and it was paid and it was just amazing. And this is at a time now there's a media course everywhere. You know, there's thousands yeah. of them in the UK. I think back then, seriously, Katie, I think there was three. I think it was one at City University, one in Cardiff, and that was it. But there was an application form. So I filled in the application. What you had to do was you had to write an article intended for a Financial Times audience. So in other words, you know, the Financial Times is very specific. It's not like writing for the Times or the Telegraph as a general. I mean, this is a business and international sort of newspaper. So they wanted to weed out those people who just want to be just generalist reporters. They said, write an article. So I was, by this time, I'd been working in a while and it was the Gulf War. The first Gulf War was happening. So I wrote a letter to the OPEC representative in London (laughs) and I told what was technically true. I said, I'm writing an article for the Financial Times. I didn't tell him it was for a traineeship. <laughs> he just said, right, clear my diary. The FT wants to interview me. Give me the interview. And then I sent that in with all the quotes and so forth. And the Financial Times thought, blimey, that's really impressive. How did you get an interview? And I said, well, I just told them I was writing for the Financial Times. And, and I think the managing editor at the time thought that was quite a ruse. So that's how I made the final list to get an interview based on nothing else. (laughs) And I did the interviews and got to the sort of final round. And then in the end, they said, look, we like you, but you haven't done a day's journalism apart from at The Voice at all. And, And there are people here who edited their university papers and done this and done that. So you've got two options. One is go to these journalism schools and spend a year doing that or go off and become what's known as a stringer, which is a freelance journalist somewhere, but with a connection to a newspaper that they give you a small stipend to live on and they pay you by the piece. They'll pay you X amount per word that you write. So I thought, I just can't face going back into a classroom again so soon. And this was at a time when so much was happening in the world. You know, there was Everything was happening in South Africa with the sort of approaching of the anti-apartheid movement, Mandela being released. He was released just as we were leaving university. Somalia was in its state. And I just thought, I'm going to go out and just take a punt and go somewhere and park myself and try and freelance for a year. But my dad at the time was horrified that I wanted to be a journalist. He thought it was just the worst thing. He just thought I was going to go into investment banking or go into the city (laughs) or law or something. And when I told him I wanted to be a journalist, I might as well told him I was going to be some sort of international arms or drugs dealer. You know, he (laughs) thought it was just awful. Because why not law or banking or something? You know, I said, look, I'm going to give this a year. If it works, Great. But if it doesn't, at least I would have tried. I won't wake up in 30, 40 years time and said, if only I had given it a go. So that was the plan. That then takes us to 1992, where you decide to go to Hong Kong with Ed Luce, who 
is today Financial Times chief US commentator. So it was worked out for him too. It's amazing. I kind of listened to all these titles that everyone has. And I think, gosh, we were such idiots when we were at university. Know, we're doing really important things now. Not me, but everyone else. So that was the plan. You were going to go with him to Hong Kong. And then what happened? Ed had already gone out there and he was expecting me to come and yep, had made the plan. And then I just had a moment of clarity, as drunks call it. I just thought at the time, so much was happening in Somalia because there were lots of family friends who I knew from growing up who were former ministers, ambassadors, leading business people who'd lost everything and were coming here as refugees to the UK to try and restart their lives. And I knew these people, I knew their kids. And it just made me think that going to Hong Kong with a great friend would have been a fantastic adventure. But if journalism is to sort of mean anything you have to turn a lens onto where you've come from, where you've got access to, because that's what journalism is so much about, is about trying to get as close to revealing a story as possible. And here was a country that was in the headlines where I had a personal connection to, where I spoke the language, where I had contacts. I just thought, no, I've got to change plans. Ditch Ed in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> he was furious at the time. But he did a few days later. He just said, look, I completely understand. So that's how I went off. Obviously, I couldn't go to Somali at the time because it was literally in the midst of civil war. The war had finished in the north, which is present day Somaliland, which is a kind of self-declared independent, not recognized by anyone, but the war had ended there. And that's, as you said, where my family originally from and, you know, our family home is and still is today. So I went to neighboring Ethiopia, which was the only way to get into the country. And a family friend said, look, there's this family in Addis Ababa who we sort of know, give them a call. And basically I ended up renting a room from them living in Addis Ababa. And I went to the BBC World Service to a program called Focus on Africa. I went to the head office here and I said, look, you don't have anyone in Addis Ababa. I'm going there and there's lots happening. And there was an editor there called Robin White who really gave me my first break. And he was someone, I think, the boss that we all wish we'd have or we wish our kids have for the first time they get a job, who really believed in investing in young people, who just enjoyed giving people a break, who was willing to take a punt on people who had initiative. Or So he said, fine, you know, look, I can't give you anything, but what I'll do is I'll write you a letter on BBC headed paper and saying, you know, you could take it to the authorities there and sure, call up and offer me stories. So that was all I needed. And I bought myself uh, basically an electric typewriter. I mean, it wasn't even a word process. I say that to my kids now, and they're sort of, you've got to be joking. you got <laughs> an electric <laughs> typewriter. <laughs> it just, it's just so different. Um, so that's how I ended up in Addis Ababa. And I lived with that family, and I stayed there for a year. There was one time when I actually managed to get to Hargeisa. So I took a, I flew to the east of Ethiopia, and then there was a big huge refugee camp and then you had to take a bus because people were going back to recover their homes in Hargeisa because I said the war had sort of ended in 1990 but the place just looked like Dresden so I wanted to go there I wanted to do a story but I also wanted to go find our family home that my dad had built in like the early 60s so I took a bus, I sort of drove in and everybody else in this bus, they'd been away for several years. Imagine sort of just going back to your home and everything's bombed out. And uh, I went into our house where my family currently live. When we go back, we stay there. You know, there's this big, today it's kind of like a sitting room library kind of thing. And there was just a refugee family cooking on the floor in a giant pot and they were like really worried. And I said, oh, this is your home. I said, no, no, don't worry. It's fine. Stay here. <laughs> they thought I'd come to boot them out and reclaim this house. So basically, after a year, I had gone as far as I could. And I, of course, the BBC Focus on Africa wanted me to stay there because, you know, I was giving them stories all the time. But I wanted to get some training and come back to London. So I said, nope, I'm coming back. And they gave me a three-month contract <laughs> when I came back. So that was my first sort of proper job in broadcasting. And your three-month contract, was that then still focused on Somalia? I was still doing quite a lot on Somalia, but not exclusively. But I was there for quite a few years. I mean, that was really, I did three months and then another three months, and then I got extended six months and then six. And then by eventually, after a couple of years, I, I managed to get a permanent job at the BBC. So that must have been mid-95, 96, something like that. And then in 90, is it 97 that you moved to Amman? 
That's right. Yeah, I got a job as a proper correspondent this time for the BBC, based in Amman in Jordan, and that was just when the sort of Middle East peace process, the Oslo Accords, was really the sort of global focus. And basically, I spent a lot of my time going over to Jerusalem. BBC had a huge bureau, still does, in Jerusalem, covering Israel and the Palestinians, and I did that for. Couple of years, but that's also where my relationship with Iraq began. Because rather than just going to Jerusalem, this was Iraq after the first Gulf War is under sanctions, very very difficult to get into. And I just basically turned up at the Iraqi embassy and just badgered them and harassed them till they were just sick of the sight of me, and just eventually managed to give me a visa. Because they weren't allowing any BBC journalists to go in at that time, were they? Exactly. Yeah. No, they weren't. And basically, every BBC correspondent that applied through the Iraqi embassy in Amman in Jordan, they basically said, "Yes, thank you. We'll show you later." And they just kind of put it in the bin straight away. <laughs> but I just this sort of connection with them because I had studied Arabic. I didn't look like a BBC correspondent. And I remember this ambassador there and the press attaché took a chance and said, "Okay, we'll give you a visa to go to Iraq." And I drove. You couldn't fly because it was under sanctions. So you drove right across the sort of desert in a taxi from Amman to Baghdad, and that was the first time I got to know Iraq. So that was back in '97, as you say. Yeah. Being allowed to go to Iraq, did you have anybody with you? Were you given a team, or did you just have to go yourself and figure it out? Initially, they just said you just. Go there, and I said, "Could I bring a?" The BBC were really excited. They said, "Well, we're going to get you a cameraman. We're going to get you a producer." Normally, they just didn't give me any resources because it was a kind <laughs> of a. It was just me there at the time in Amman. But I applied and said, "Could I bring colleagues?" And they said, "No. First of all, just you come. We want to understand who you are." So I went. It was just me. I spent about five days. I did a couple of stories. You just show up somewhere, and you're doing some stories. I mean, how do you? Start finding out where the stories are and who to talk to. It's become so second nature because suddenly there's a crisis somewhere. You just take off. None of you have ever been there. You just land at the airport and you just busk it. To be honest, and that's sort of what you have to do. But there's always certain things you try and work with. Local journalists who are already there. You hire them and say, "Look, can you be my guide and fixer and general savior?" And it's one of the things that in journalism that goes very under. Appreciated or underreported, the extent to which what you see on the news or read in your newspaper is basically built on just this huge number of journalists who can't leave their countries if it's a place like Iraq or Afghanistan, but who work with international newspapers and TV stations to report that. So I turned up at the Ministry of Information because this was under the Saddam dictatorship. You had to register. They gave you a press card. They gave you a minder to make sure that you didn't. Do anything or take any pictures of military installations and all of that, and you know you befriend them and they help you, and then then you start building up slowly your own network and you build up a sort a sense of where to go, and you just ask lots of questions. Where's the best place to meet these kind of people, or how do I make an appointment with this official body? And then you just walk and drive around, and if something. Interests you just get out and start talking to people. It's strange. I mean, because Iraq at that time there weren't a lot of foreigners at all. It was a completely closed society. But that was also what made it so amazing. Because at that time, like today, if you go to somewhere really rare that you don't get access, everyone wants to know about it. So you could pretty much write any story. <laughs> <laughs> so you were there for six years, on and off, before the invasion, and. And of course, there's been so much written about it, reported about it. But you were right there. How was life for the average Iraqi under Saddam Hussein? Before the invasion, I and dozens of colleagues—Americans, Brits, French, you name it—could walk anywhere in Baghdad and be completely fine and safe. But、well, that's because there was a sort of military dictatorship. I mean, I'm not trying to say things were nice because it was brutally repressive. But on the whole. If you were an Iraqi that worked under the system and stayed out of politics and basically accepted the dictatorship and just went on your life, you could get on with your normal life. There was no, there was not the kind of utter breakdown in in law and order and the violent gangs and militias that was apparent within weeks after days after the fall of the regime. But then again, it came at a huge price for ordinary Iraqis who were just governed under this horrible system. Post the invasion, we needed 
armored cars, bodyguards. We lived in secure compounds. We couldn't go out and meet Iraqis. Um, so it was a completely different state of affairs. Going back to the, before the invasion, I guess by that stage, you're meeting and knowing and friends with some of the weapons inspectors. So at that point, were you pretty sure there was nothing going on? It was clear that the Iraqi military and security force was never intended and not fit for purpose in terms of facing an international military force. It was there really to repress its own people. We became a figure of ridicule, the so-called comical Ali, who's the Minister of Information. That was just a facade to the outside world. There wasn't really anything there. But what I was shocked by was the fact that there was absolutely nothing, that after years of actually after the invasion, scouring the whole place, there wasn't even a drum of something as simple as mustard gas, so not a sophisticated weapons program. I remember sitting in Baghdad just before the war and hearing a speech, I think it was just a few weeks before the war, and Tony Blair was, I think it was the spring conference, and he was in Glasgow, Edinburgh, I forget, and he said, if you saw the reports that came across my desk, the dangers of weapons of mass destruction, and I thought to myself, you know, maybe I've, we've got this wrong. Maybe there really is weapons, you know, here. Maybe we've got this utterly wrong. It was just shocking that it was based on nothing. And so living there as you did, how did you feel about the impending war? Those were probably the most fractious and worrying time because the press corps in the run-up to the war was maybe like a 1,000 to 1,500 strong, just from all over the world. And it's just this kind of bubble of anxiety. And there were all these stories of what would happen to us as Westerners. We'd be taken hostage and then we'd be tied up as human shields across the bridges and so forth. But by that time, I knew a lot of people who were functionaries, if you like, in the, in the regime, who knew what was coming and who knew that the regime would not be able to sort of withstand it. It took a lot of bravery for them to say and said, look, Maggie, you guys, the press, are probably going to be the most protected people in Baghdad because the regime will want you to represent what's happening in the outside world. They need your images and your words to go out about the reality of the war here. They're not going to do anything to you. You'll, in fact, be the most protected. And these were people I'd sort of had to trust with my life previously. And I'd got to know them, their families. And in those little cracks of intimate moments, you began to see and they began to talk outside of the regime and express what they really felt. And once they did that, I was able to trust them. But then the press corps, two days before the invasion, I think President Bush gave Saddam and his family a 48-hour chance that we can avoid war if Saddam Hussein leaves the country. And in that period, the press corps went from like 12, 1300 down to a couple of hundred. And I sort of looked and I thought, here are some of the most experienced international correspondents and reporters leaving. You know, what the hell are you doing staying here? And in fact, by the time I thought I actually might leave, it was too late. The border was closed. <laughs> so I ended up staying because there was actually a very good friend who'd left, reached the border and told, no, turn back. So he came back. And once I saw him in the hotel lobby where we were all staying, I said, what are you doing here, Kim? And he said, the border's closed. So that's actually the real story, how I came to be in Baghdad reporting from there. Wow. And how about your wife, Nina? Because she was in South Africa then with two of your three small children. And how is she feeling about all of this? Well, I think the worst thing about this job that I do, and I sort of realise it now, people always ask, you know, is it really dangerous for you? Is it really bad? How did you cope with that? It's actually much, much worse for your nearest and dearest. And it was incredibly difficult for Nina. Although she did say, you know, if you die, I'm going to kill you, which I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, really very, very difficult. And with hindsight, it does tend to sort of see it as a really selfish thing almost. My mother was beside herself. I remember phoning my brother up and I said, just don't get her to watch the TV, turn the TV. He said, I can't. She's just watching it all the time. And then at the end, towards the invasion, there were several colleagues who were killed when the Americans shelled the hotel we were staying in. And that was probably the worst moment because I think I was just getting ready to do a live broadcast. I was just walking around the rooftop live position and I had my earpiece in and then I just heard this enormous thud on top of the building. And it was quite clear that an artillery round had hit it. 
And then we ran up and it was the Reuters Bureau had been hit. I think what had happened is that there were some cameramen who were on a balcony with their cameras on a tripod. The story is that one American armored personnel carrier who was on the other side of the Tigris River was looking and thought that that was someone with a rocket propelled grenade or something and fired on it. But the thing is, the Americans knew that this was the hotel where the press were. I mean, it was just so known and so obvious. So at that point, my good friend and colleague, Paul Danahar, who was the sort of bureau chief then, just said, right, everybody call your families now, because that was going out live on on air. So people might thought parents, wives, husbands, whoever, might have thought that could be him or her. So that was probably the worst time. And one of your colleagues from Reuters, he was killed in that explosion, wasn't he? Yeah, Taras Protrus, he was killed, yeah, and one or two others uh, wounded. And that was, having to get up and go again after that was very, very difficult and trying. Maybe I'm wrong, but in the same day, didn't the Al Jazeera office get bombed? And there was another colleague of yours who who died. Yeah, yeah. He was thinking of leaving, and but he decided to stay. That was much more egregious because there... It wasn't in the hotel. Al Jazeera had a separate big house on the other side of the river. It had media, Al Jazeera on it. That was a deliberate sort of uh, targeting of that building. I mean, without any doubt. You go through an experience like that. Obviously, you're seeing some of these horrendous things every day. But when it's your own friends and it's so immediate and it could have been you, how do you respond in that moment? Do you, I guess you're so busy, you just sort of get on with what has to be done. But do you have some, some reaction later on? Or how do you process it? Yeah, you do. You inevitably do. I think journalism has become much, much better at giving counselling and support and help. I mean, that's just a fundamental part of this job. Whereas before, it didn't. It was a sort of very macho, just have a drink and go down the pub with your mates, get over it, like that sort of culture, which it isn't now. But the other thing is that in those situations, and it's really important for people to know this, is that in those most, when you see humanity at its worst, you also see humanity at its best. So when you see people helping other people, neighbours, all that kind of stuff. So I'd say that as much as the different conflicts and human upheaval I've seen, I've witnessed humans at their best. And it's very important to hold on to that. And there were lots of sort of incidences in Iraq where that was true. Also, we just felt driving around the city and going to people and interviewing them. These were British bombs falling on their homes and we were British citizens and we're working for the British Broadcasting Corporation. And yet no one, everyone, people welcomed us to our homes. They wanted their stories told. There There was only one incident, I think, in which people expressed their hatred of Britain. It became like that after the invasion and during the occupation of Iraq. Then the atmosphere completely changed because I think to put it in a nutshell, it was kind of, thank you very much for overthrowing Saddam Hussein, now get lost and leave us to ourselves. But when we just stay and the American state, that's when the whole dynamic changed and how Iraq is viewed journalism or journalists changed as well. I think we began to be seen as very much part of the Western presence in Iraq. And that's when you started to get journalists being kidnapped and taken hostage and so forth. Did you have to compromise any of your reporting? Because the narrative in the UK was was one thing and you were seeing quite different things where you were. And I don't know how much you were censored or if you were at all. Whilst the regime existed and was in control, I never had any of my pieces or my scripts examined by uh, anyone. But this was a dictatorial regime. There's no question about it. And everyone was going to say, we support Saddam Hussein. I think all our reports were prefaced by this has been Ragiem or whoever's report has been compiled under Iraqi restrictions and so forth. But you always find ways in journalism. Look, we report from authoritarian and dictatorial regimes all over the world. But that's what television does. Its picture tells a thousand words. And you find ways to actually convey the reality of what this is. You don't have to say, in this awful dictatorship here that I'm reporting from, (laughs) people are utterly oppressed. (laughs) But what I would say is the war went on and slowly the regime began to sort of crumble from within. Then, of course, we were able to report far more freely. It was much easier to report 
than it was afterwards. Because afterwards, we were just with our walled compounds and it was very dangerous to go outside. If you did, you literally just went somewhere in downtown Baghdad, got out, did a your piece of camera within 15 seconds, 20 seconds, and then you go. Everyone called it 20 second rule. So you never hang around somewhere for more than 20, 30 seconds because everyone's on a mobile phone. I've got, seen these Westerners hanging out in these street corners. So it became much harder to get into Iraqi society after the invasion, after the regime fell and the occupation began. And did you have any inkling before that it was going to be so lawless and there was going to be these lootings and the kidnappings and that complete unravelling of the society, which, in fact, we were supposed to be overseeing a change to something much more sort of democratic and benign. Could anyone have predicted that? No, because the narrative then was so much had been focused on the awfulness of Saddam. And this is part of the problem. You could take this to Afghanistan, take this. When a narrative says this regime or that regime is pure evil, that's so awful, it therefore plants in your mind the idea that whatever follows is going to be wonderful and liberal, democratic and so forth, which without really examining the substance within the society and its history and the makeup. So the answer is, with hindsight, yes, we could have seen it because we knew that Iraq was and the regime was fundamentally sectarian. There was a large Shia population that had been oppressed for so long. But what none of us saw was just the rapid nature in, in which it would take place. I remember going back in the first few months, so that would have been May, June, July of 2003, when we could still go around Baghdad, just the criminality that you would never have had during the regime because it was a dictatorial regime, because there were security forces. You know, I could walk at two o'clock in the morning from one end of Baghdad to the other and no one would touch a hair on my head because there was a brutal regime that would make sure that horrible things happened to you if you did that. And just the gangsterism, it began with that lawlessness and the looting. It was just a free-for-all in the complete absence of any order I remember going to Basra and there was a petrol station and there was a queue about four miles long and it was 45 degrees and there were two British squaddies who were just close to passing out, having to govern this petrol station because everyone had gone, you know, <laughs> there was no one who could maintain it. And that was the moment I saw that, to me, that this was just not going to work. And there was rising anger. And I remember San Iraqi saying to me, how is it that the great British nation can't even make the petrol stations run? And we're sitting on one of the largest oil fields in the world in the South. So, and it was very hard to answer that. And I, that was the moment for me, I thought, this is not going to function, this post Saddam. There was no plan, effectively. How much longer were you there? After the invasion, I stayed for about a month or five weeks, went back home, which was very nice. And I'll tell you the thing, you sort of asked earlier, how do you cope with these kind of situations? I think the best thing is just to go back and just do what you normally did. I remember that I got flew back to Johannesburg, went home. And the first thing I did when I got home was to go straight back as quickly as I could into the family routine. Got to the airport, got home, dumped my stuff and just took the kids out for a walk and the dog. And that, that was uh, it. I think sometimes the pitfalls of journalism is that you go off and experience these utterly strange, crazy, barely imaginable scenarios that most people just cannot imagine. And it's easy to think that that's what everyone does. There are some journalists who come back and think that that's what people do. You know, you get on a plane, go to a country, interview the president. It's not. It's utterly abnormal. That's just, it's not normal. Um, and so for me, it's just getting back to normality is a good coping mechanism. And maybe your ability to adapt from your earlier years means you can adapt better. I have a friend of mine whose husband is a mountaineer and she always says when he comes back from an expedition, which is nothing like as traumatic as what you are looking at, but that it takes him a good month to mentally clock back into being with the family and being part of their life. But maybe your ability from an early age to adapt means that you're better at doing that. I think you're right. I think I've had to sort of, as you were saying, we were talking about earlier, you know, adapting between cultures, between homes, between languages, just means you can make those transitions a bit easier. I think without doubt, that's absolutely true. And have you at any stage thought, I'm struggling today? 
Definitely. I did. And it was perhaps a delayed sort of thing of about six months. I wasn't sleeping. I was very, very short and snappy with people around me. And I did reach out and get some sort of help. And it's also very much part of the training now, training about just how to stay safe and basic thing, first aid, one of the most important things, and mental as well as physical coping mechanisms. I travel a lot less now, and I really don't miss it. I've, I've used up my nine <laughs> lives. But I remember a really, really wise colleague right at the beginning of my career where I just wanted to travel everywhere and get on a plane. And if I wasn't, if I was left off the team, I was feeling, oh my God, this is a disaster. <laughs> and he said, Raggy, Raggy, he said, the day will come and it will be one day where the phone will go and they say, can you go on the plane? We're deploying to wherever. And you'll just want to hide under the table. And it's so true. It just goes like that. You just suddenly think, I just don't want to do this anymore. Ultimately, it, it hits your soul somewhere because you're looking at awful things happening to normal people again and again, mostly. Of course, you'd, I don't want to make it sound as though there aren't any uplifting stories. There are. There are many that I've been privileged to report on. But it has a time limit for sure. For some, for others, it's just they'll carry on doing it because it's just a permanent high. I don't want to speak for other people, but there's a sense of purpose. You're informing the world. You're helping societies and politicians and holding them to account. That's all very true. And that keeps people going. You come back, you make some documentaries, you make the Jesus miracles, and then you move to Al Jazeera, where you are for seven years. And what prompted that move? I thought it was time to leave the BBC. And it was just exciting to be part of a, one of the last ever global television startups. And it was nice to be asked to be one of the first people to join. Al Jazeera really came into its own you know, internationally during the 2003 invasion and occupation. They were going to resource it very well to be challenger to the CNN and BBC and all of that. And I wanted also just go and make documentaries, which I just rather than the daily news reports. And I enjoyed it. And it was a great seven years. We well, were Middle Eastern correspondent and presented Witness every night. And then you did the Raggy Omar report, which was a monthly one hour investigative documentary. Were you able to decide what you reported on? That was the other nice thing is actually, I was in a position to influence the editorial process. Actually, choosing what to report, why. And, and that was a very interesting process. You witnessed their offices being bombed in Baghdad. You watched them being bombed in Kabul. I don't think you were there, but they happened in Gaza as well. Why was all this sort of antagonism directed against Al Jazeera? I think Al Jazeera pushed a very different narrative to the Western media narrative, and it was set up for that purpose. It was to present the news from a non-Western perspective. And it poked a lot of beehives, if you like. That was what it was set up to do. And that's what it tried to do. That doesn't excuse its bombing in various places. But at the beginning, it attracted people from every single news organization you can imagine, you know, American broadcasters, CNN, BBC, ITV, you name it. People with huge reputations and experience joined to experience that. I've watched a number of your clips reporting from all over the place and four or five minutes will be a typical length of report and it'll have you doing the voiceover. There'll be, a, could be 12 different shots in all of that. Then you're interviewing someone, then you're in front of the camera and we get such an amazing sense of what's going on. Can you talk about what goes on behind that and who all the characters are because an immense amount of work and research and planning must go into all of that. Each report is probably that specific report, let alone the sort of newsrooms and the organizations and everything else. It will be probably 15, 20 people. There'll be people who are the foreign editor, the foreign desk assistants, the local translators, drivers, the cameraman or camera woman, a producer, and obviously the correspondents. There'll be someone in the graphics department who might make a graphic. But in the field itself, the core team is normally a correspondent, a producer, and a cameraman, camera woman. 
and a local employee who is the local fixer, producer, who will be in that country and will act as a translator and basically guardian angel. Without them, actually, none of this happens really seriously. I mean, if you just turn up in, in a country that you don't speak the language, you don't know anyone, it's curtains. You won't get anything. So you're only really as good as the local journalist that one works with. Then for each three-minute, four-minute piece, we would have shot several hours of material and in fact, that's the bit I enjoy most is going back to edit. It's, it's by far the most sort of creative process because you learn to tell a story through pictures and not words, ideally. And there's lots of disagreements. You know, a producer will say you shouldn't include that shot. We haven't mentioned this. You need to stress that a bit more. So it's very much a collective process. And there's a very famous <laughs> phrase, a punchline that says in television, the correspondent gets all the glory the cameraman gets all the money and the producer gets all the blame. <laughs> <So> <laughs> and it's the bit I enjoy most. And of course, it's not just my words. My script will be, have been influenced by my colleagues who would have seen something in a different way to me and say, why are you saying, putting emphasis on that? Don't you feel that this is more important or that again, that? And that's what I enjoy most about television rather than writing, where it's very much your own voice. And has it changed a lot? Because, of course, everyone now has their mobile phones. Everyone's recording things. You can send something in a flash. How has that changed the whole process? It's completely changed. I remember four years ago, five years ago, maybe, going to Downing Street to do there was some official visit by a foreign head of state. And I remember seeing a correspondent from another country who was based in London. And they had a tripod and they had an iPad and they had the headphones and they were broadcasting live. From, and I thought, my goodness, you know, we're all going to be redundant. <laughs> <in those times." laughs> but you're right. All you need is a mobile phone. I think that's one of the things during lockdown that's been, it's gone another leap now because suddenly we couldn't meet up. We couldn't edit in edit suites, which are quite small. We had to work from home. But how do you work from home doing an international news report? And of course, we discovered all this technology like we're on now that we're able to communicate. So the first piece I did was about COVID, obviously, and how it was affecting the rest of the world. And the cameraman who was also editing was in Johannesburg. I was here in my study where I'm talking to you from now. And the producer was in Wembley. And we're all communicating via Zoom and editing. And then I sent my script through my phone. I just recorded it into my phone. There we were thinking phones are just to talk to people, but now they're sort of mini recording studios. Now there's another widget, which allows me to have a professional lip mic connected to my iPhone. And I just record my script and then I just email the script. So it's just crazy. We now don't even need edit suites. Anyone could be a broadcasting station with a laptop and a phone and an internet connection, basically. It's amazing. I'm, I'm sadly, I am way behind on all of that. <laughs> Going back to ITN. So you, after Al Jazeera, you moved to ITN. Again, what's the motivation behind that? I wanted to come back home. There was a fork in the road. I could either carry on being an international broadcaster on global channels, or you could come back to the UK and be involved in the journalism here. I mean, at a certain point, I'd want to stop traveling. I didn't want to be a correspondent really anymore. And I wanted to be a presenter and to be able to sort of present a holistic news that involved politics or social care, et cetera. And you get to shape and contribute to the editorial process. But I wanted to be involved in a channel that was focused on the UK, because that's where my home is, is where my kids are growing up or have grown up. And I didn't want to float about in this international channels all over the world where you're seen in hundreds of hotel, millions of hotel rooms. So basically, I wanted to come back and be involved in broadcasting in the UK and helping to shape news and journalism in the UK. And ITV can't think of a better place to do that. Reflecting back over your whole career and of all the reporting that you've done, which report are you most proud of? Well, the one I'm most proud of, or the one I'll remember the longest and probably means the most, is the extraordinary opportunity I had in 2005 to interview Nelson Mandela, Madiba. 
which was uh, extraordinary. And he was, I think, one of the very, very last in-person interviews he gave. It was at his home in uh, Johannesburg. Well, it was in his home. And I just remember as soon as we got confirmation that this was happening, I, I've never said this about any other assignment I've ever had in my life. I just thought, I wish I could take my children, Nina and, and the kids, to just to see him and uh, be with him. I mean, it's uh, I can't think of any other figure really since, I don't know, I mean... Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi. He's, he's on that pantheon of people who've changed this world. So it was extraordinary. Did he live up to your expectations? Oh, yeah. And much more. He was, uh, you know, when you go and meet presidents and prime ministers and religious leaders and so forth, in a lot of them, most people I met, you go when they're in office and when they're not in office. They'll have pictures of them, you know, here I am with the Pope <laughs> and here I am with President so-and-so. It's all about a gallery of their greatest hits. Mandela didn't have any of that at all. He didn't have a single, he didn't need to do that. What there was, was there was a little cartoon, which was a cartoon from a South African newspaper, the Sowetan. And it was basically, it was around the time when Britain was trying to pitch for the World Cup. And they were going around countries and they were sending David Beckham to talk to people saying, can you give us a vote to hold the World Cup? So the Sowetan had done that. And this just sort of captures the way he's just the most self-deprecating, just the most brilliant, brilliant human being. So this cartoon was a man and their son sitting in Soweto Township watching the TV. And on the TV, there is Nelson Mandela and David Beckham. (laughs) And the kid is saying to his father, look, pointing to the TV, said, Dad, who's that old bloke with David Beckham? That's what he had. And I just thought that just captures his view of life really, really well. And he didn't disappoint. He was just funny, quite stern. If you made a mistake, he kind of picked you up on it. He just said what he meant and meant what he said, to use that old cliche. Sometimes when you do meet one's heroes, they do disappoint often. But he didn't. He just confirmed everything I felt about him before. If someone were to ask me who I'd want to most meet in my life, it would be him. And so how much time did you actually have with him? I had a lot of time and he was quite frail by then. He was still sharp as anything, but 2005. So he was, I think he'd sort of retired. He retired from public life about three, four years after that. So I had a good hour and a half with him, I think. Not a small, I mean, coming on for two hours. And it was just him and me. And well, obviously a cameraman. And he'd come into a room and rather than greeting you, the correspondent first, he'd always talk to the sound person or the sound recordist or whoever else was not in sort of role. And he'd crack jokes. And he was just hilarious. He was just an amazing flirt. I mean, with both men and women, you know, you couldn't help but just be charmed by him. Wow. What about your most surprising moment? I wish I retained this videotape, and it was on tape at the time. We were in Kabul. It was just before Kabul fell to the Taliban. So it was like got myself, Paul Danaha, Andrew Kilrain, and, and Fred Scott had got the last visa that the Taliban issued before they collapsed in November 2001. We we're doing a piece to camera in Kabul, and the sun was setting, but we we're in the shade. We needed a reflector to bounce the light off. Sometimes you use those shiny reflector things. The cameraman couldn't record and hold the f- reflector at the same time. And in fact, he ended up needing two reflectors because it was only natural light. And then there were these two Taliban soldiers, you know, that were with us. So he recorded this piece of camera with these Taliban guys holding a reflector to, to light, <laughs> light me up. And he took a picture of that. Yeah, I know if people knew what goes into their TV reports, it's just very bizarre. With your team going through all of these intense moments, maybe intensely good, intensely exciting, intensely awful, I guess one of the key things to get you through it is some humour. So can you describe a hilarious moment? I couldn't possibly uh, reveal the (laughs) it all goes wrong. Yeah, there's so many. I remember having my 30th birthday on the border between the Gaza Strip and going back into Israel and Oh, just so many weird and funny moments. <laughs> I once actually, I'll admit this, I think the first time ever, I actually fell asleep during an interview <laughs> whilst I was interviewing someone. <laughs> and that was because it was in Bangkok and I'd flown from Greece to 
the USA to do an interview that suddenly was an emergency interview, better do it. And then I spent a night in Minneapolis and then I flew again on another. So I'd basically gone from Greece to the USA, back to France, down to Bangkok within about two days. And then they said, we've got to do this other interview. It was a time when there were lots of riots in Bangkok from rival political parties and there was uh, people we were interviewing. And I was just exhausted. <laughs> uh, my time clock was just completely crazy. It was just really hot and muggy in Bangkok. So I sat down, I drove straight from the airport. I was already sort of couldn't help doze <laughs> off, you know, I'll clearly keep my eyes open. So I sat down, I just took a massive glug of water and then the heat got to me. And I just, in the middle of this poor woman's sort of reply, I just kind of, <laughs> so oh, there's just kind of bizarre moments <laughs> like that. No, there must be so many. The more intense the situation, the more you have to laugh. What advice, the main piece of advice would you give to young aspiring journalists? But more than anything else, I think journalism is just about listening to other people's stories and just having the chance to just sit and talk to people. And sometimes there's a lot of pressure, there's deadlines. And I just remember that all the time when you're asking someone to tell a story where they might have lost their home or something's happened to a loved one of theirs or their business has gone bust, some huge momentous thing. You can't rush them and say, OK, get to the good bit. <laughs> you just have to wait. And I think my advice is be interested in other people who are very different from me, I suppose. Well, and you'll always have been fantastic at that. What advice would you give to a young Raggy Omar? Because you didn't need to give yourself that advice. Go into investment banking. No, <laughs> it could be value the experiences you have, but also never underestimate the impact journalism has on your loved ones and those around you, because it really does. And, uh, and you learn that during the process, but at the beginning, you don't realise it because it is a selfish thing to do. You're away from, I, mean, I remember my son Sammy was nine months when I went to the Iraq invasion. I mean, what was I doing? I mean, I think back now, if something had happened, I think, what are you on? How could you possibly do that? I look back and I just think, it can be a supremely selfish and self-indulgent profession. We started with your family. Let's go back to your family. And Raggy's an old Somali name. And Abdul Rahman is your second name. And that's an Islamic name. And in your book, Only Half of Me, you talk about these three elements to your life. So your British nationality, your Somali heritage, and your Islamic faith. How do you make your children either aware or keep them close to their Somali heritage? Because it must be harder as time goes on. It is. And that was something that I and Nina were very, very conscious of from the beginning. And we go back very regularly. It's really from when they were tiny. They've been going pretty successive regularly. And they're completely at home with it. And, you know, Somaliland is not like Nairobi or South Africa. I mean, it's a very different, really quite poor, developing, but it's really, really different to anyone. But it's second home, it's second nature to them. And they know the vast array of aunts and great aunts and cousins. And, and that's very important. We cook Somali food here in the house and they love it. So, yeah, it's part of their identity too. In your book, you talk about some of the sort of heartbreaking stories and some heartwarming stories of Somali refugees living in the UK. And one of the ones that you mentioned towards the end is that your cousin, who's just come from Somalia, shows up and it's just after the suicide bombings on the 7th of July. And he's attacked by five or six men and stabbed. In the wake of that awful national trauma, there was a sense in which people who looked like him, who were you know, Muslim, were deemed by some people to be an enemy. And I have to say, Britain, my society, our society, reacted in a way to show that that was not the direction of travel that any of us wanted to sort of go in. And so despite that horrible incident, the whole point of the book is that not only how I find it the best country in the world to be made up of lots of different composite identities. I mean, look, I mean, we live in London, but it could be Birmingham or Manchester or anywhere else. We're all mixed in, aren't we? And we all come from different cultures and places. And 
I think of all Western societies, Britain is the most at ease with itself in that way, more than I've just come back from France. It's a very, very different place. As much as France is also has many different cultures, it's not as ease with this identity of itself in the way that Britain is. That's just my idea. I'm sure someone who's French would react differently. So there was another story that in addition to that story of what happened to my cousin, I mean, there's another thing that happened and I've written about more recently that shows the complete opposite of that, which is involves another cousin of mine who got sick with COVID. I mean, really quite seriously sick. And on the day in April of last year, 2020, when the Prime Minister Boris Johnson was taken into St. Thomas's intensive care unit, and there really was a moment where he thought he was going to die. My cousin was in exactly the same ward as the Prime Minister. So here's this immigrant, (laughs) his parents came here as refugees in the same ward as Boris Johnson. And that seemed to me, and I had to present the news that night about Boris Johnson going to intensive care unit, knowing at the same time that my cousin was in the same unit. And it was very funny. He survived. He's well. And I remember talking to him and I said, are you in the same ward as Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister? And he said, yeah, but he was a lightweight. He was out after 10 days. I soldiered <laughs> on for three months. <laughs> Poor so guy. That was quite funny. The very last sentence of your book, I'm going to read it back to you because I think it is really encapsulates what needs to happen and you put it beautifully which is it is only when the voice of the individual is lifted above the waves of condemnation that all of us can begin to see a little more clearly and perhaps to realize that our worlds are not in conflict at all i think that's very beautifully said i think that's true i think that's also what all the reporting i've done ultimately families whatever they are go through the same emotions when faced with the same challenges. You know, we all want the best for our children. It's not rocket science. It's actually very, very simple. Final question, because I have kept you so long, so much longer than I said. What about the next 20 years? I don't know. Lots of gardening. I like cooking, traveling. I don't know. I try to not have too much of a plan. That back of an envelope, I'm going to be this by 20, this by 30 and so forth. I'm (laughs) fascinated by the world and traveling it and experiencing it so but not sure it'd be as a sort of journalist I don't know maybe a cookery program or or something (laughs) like that I don't know (laughs) he's napped up on that but thank you so much I'm a bit sad that it's taken me 30 years to ask some of these questions but you have been amazingly kind to let me ask them today so Raggy thank you thank you Katie pleasure Thank you for listening to Katie Brewer at Bandwidth Conversations. If you would like to know more about us, please email katie at bandwidthconversations.com. We hope to see you again soon. Mm-hmm.